Hello, everyone. Uh, this is another episode of the Unisoft Question, a uh, YouTube uh, show and podcast where I interview lawyers. I really prefer interviewing litigators even at this point. And uh, we talk about this profession and the work that we all do. Today, I have a fantastic guest, and I'm really honored and pleased to have her here with us today. Uh, Maureen Welton, a managing partner at Stevenson Welton McDonald and Swan LLP here in Toronto. Hello, Maureen. Thank you for coming here. You're welcome, and it's lovely to be here. Um, I do have a correction, though. The firm is now Stevenson Welton LLP. McDonald's oh, okay. no longer a part of our firm. That's that's great. I was just going off your LinkedIn profile. I guess you know LinkedIn has a vulnerability. You gotta go, you gotta dig deeper. <laughs> Thank you for correcting that. Uh, you went to uh, Saint Francis Xavier University for your undergraduate degree, correct? Yes, I did. And so that's in Nova Scotia. Yes, Saint FX is in Antigonish, Nova Scotia. It's a small Nova school. Scotia. Yes. Are you are you originally from Nova Scotia? No, I grew up in Ottawa, um, but my parents were both from the Maritimes. They were both from New Brunswick, and so when it came time to choose an undergraduate university, I was drawn to the Maritimes, and. St. FX is essentially the school that they would agree to. So that's where I landed. Were you seeking some independence from your parents? I was, I wanted to, I wanted to go away. I wanted to, I, I wanted to uh, uh, live in residence. I wanted a small campus. I, I wanted a school where, where there would be good academic opportunities, but that it would also uh, be collegial and um, I, I would get to know people. It would be small. It would, I was, I was looking for a, for, for a particular atmosphere and St. FX filled that atmosphere. So you were very happy with uh, that university, I assume. Yes. What was your major? I majored in political science and minored in psychology. Is there anything in childhood that predicts uh, the child's career as a lawyer in the future, in your opinion? No. Um, I, I think a wide, I think law draws a wide variety of people, people with very different abilities and different interests. Um, I have given some thought to whether there's anything in childhood that would predict someone becoming a litigator. Um, because I, I do think going into law is, is um, you, you could decide to go into law with so many different interests and uh, right. you be drawn to intellectual property law uh, or corporate law uh, or human rights law, there are so many different types of law that you could be drawn to for different reasons. Um, but uh, litigators, uh, I, I think it's a little bit different. I, I, I do wonder whether litigators, you're not likely to be drawn to litigation if you don't enjoy speaking in public. Uh-huh. So uh, what Describe your ideal litigator. We all aspire to ideals, right? When you practice sports or when you practice an art or when you um, practice a profession, you want to know about the best representatives of your field or even ideal representations uh, of uh, members of your profession. What is an ideal litigator in your mind? Ah, interesting question. Interesting question. Uh, litigation, I think litigation is, is divided into parts. It, um, it, one part of litigation is uh, uh, what you would learn in law school. One part of litigation is being able to take a fact scenario 
uh, understand what the issues are, uh, research the issues, and de develop a, a, an understanding of, of what the case is about and how the law applies to the case. Um, and of course, uh, uh, being able to research and, and uh, uh, understand from the cases uh, or the statutes or whatever materials you're researching, uh, how they apply to the facts and developing the issues, all of that is, is a skill. And being good at that is important to being a good litigator. The second part of litigation is, is the actual litigating skills. It and um, I, I worry that those skills are undervalued where uh, uh, we aren't, where, where litigators are not able to practice them as much as they used to. It, uh, um, but those skills uh, being peer advocacy, being able to be persuasive to an adjudicator uh, in whatever form that adjudicator is in, being able to be persuasive to, to, uh, 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 to bring them to how you see the events, how you see the facts, how you see the law applying to those facts uh, is a skill. Uh, Cross-examining is a skill. Examine, even examinations for discovery is a skill. And of course, uh, it, trial skills. It, um, uh, I, I know in a trial, both examination in chief or cross-examination, um, uh, I argue those are almost different skills than examining out of court. It, uh, uh, trial skills or hearing skills. If you're uh, 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 if you're more used to arbitrations or you're more used to tribunals, but hearing skills are skills in and of themselves. It um, uh, but all of these being good at those skills is a big part of being a good litigator. It uh, and I have watching people through the years. There's no question that some people, um, uh, there are excellent litigators who are particularly good uh, at some of those things who are, uh, it, there are certainly litigators that are particularly good cross examiners or litigators that are particularly good at arguing motions. Um, and of course, there are litigators who are particularly good at trials, but those are the, those skills are a big part of being a good litigator. Um, uh, and of course, it, it negotiations and um, uh, being able to resolve the case uh, in a way that your client is happy with is also uh, uh, a part of being a good litigator. Um, uh, and even, even uh, dealing with opposing counsel in, in the day-to-day, -day, uh, uh, I've learned it, it is, in my view, it is part of being a good litigator uh, to be able to move the file in a, in, in a way where you're working uh, with opposing counsel. It, um, uh, you may see things very differently and you're arguing uh, very, a uh, very different perspective of the case, but uh, there is an element of working with people that is important. Um, and the last thing I'd say, I know I'm going on, but uh, dealing with clients is critical. Or uh, uh, um, whether your clients are institutional and and you're dealing uh, with uh, uh, a rep. Of, of the institution in some way. Um, so uh, uh, it, isn't, it isn't their money, so to speak, that is on the line, but uh, uh, it, is, it is their career. It, it, the case will still be important to the person that you're dealing with um, or whether you're dealing with individual clients where, where, uh, uh, where the case is very personal to them. It, 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 Dealing with clients is um, uh, uh, 
matters to, to uh, uh, the quality of the litigator. And the last, this time it is the last thing I'll say, is uh, um, that the best litigators that, that, uh, that I've ever seen, um, there's something else. It isn't, it isn't just the sum of the parts. It isn't just, well, they're good at these eight things and that makes them a good litigator. There is, there is something else where, uh, uh, where they take all of this that I've, that I've just described, um, uh, develop it in, in their own style and what results is an extraordinary litigator. And, uh, um, I, and watching those people is to me has always been a, a big pleasure. Wow, lots of food for thought. There are two trends in modern civil litigation, at least in Ontario. Well, the first trend is to decide things on a base of a written record, right? So uh, summary judgment motions uh, and uh, the increase in their role in civil proceedings. And uh, the second trend is more recent and it has to do with COVID-19. Uh, for example, in Toronto, as far as I remember, some uh, motions will now be resolved in completely in writing without a hearing uh, in uh, virtual or in person. Uh, for example, uh, some uh, short motions before judges, if I remember correctly, are subject to written review and may be decided as a result of that review. So there is a clear path to a, a decision in writing without submissions from counsel. So these two trends uh, exist. Uh, also, everybody, I guess, is familiar with this old principle that we all hear in law school that uh, about 80% of, uh, of the success um, uh, in appeals, for example, or, or in motions uh, depends on written submissions and uh, written advocacy. And about 20% or 25% depends on oral advocacy. So how do you square these trends and uh, ideas with this notion that lawyers need hearing skills lawyers need to be able to persuade um, with, with personal submissions, with some kind of personal appeal, personal interaction with a judge. And so I'd, I'd say two things. One is uh, uh, that was an omission on my part. I, uh, of course, uh, um, I was thinking of litigators in a courtroom when I was answering your question, but yes, uh, the ability to write and to write well and write persuasively is also a key part of being a good litigator. So uh, big omission on my part, it is a key part of being a good litigator. I, I think it is, um, I, I, no matter the form that you're going to, uh, writing is going to be a big part of it. And I'd even say, and I've said to um, more junior lawyers at my firm, even the ability to, to, the ability to write can even impact your relationship with opposing counsel. It, um, uh, uh, being able to put tone and tenor into your communications that is appropriate to what you're saying uh, matters and being able to write well matters. Um, so I, I, uh, I, 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 I certainly, I didn't intend to suggest that writing wasn't key and important to litigators. That said, uh, you're right that, uh, uh, that the pandemic has brought the technology issue, um, which, uh, uh, advocates, uh, in Ontario, um, uh, and frankly, across the country, but I, I, I've been personally involved in some of the, the, uh, the attempts by advocates in Ontario uh, to, to move technology to the forefront 
of, uh, of the Attorney General's mind. And the pandemic has, has made that happen at lightning speed. Um, I, 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 I think that, that that is somewhat separate from uh, the modern trend to uh, have matters decided in writing. Um, I, I think that the, the push for that trend had started before the pandemic, um, particularly on the part of the Court of Appeal. The pandemic has just had it move forward at more at, 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 uh, at a speed with which we are not uh, uh, used to. Um, I, it, it, do I think that on a go forward basis, that that means um, that a, 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 an advocate's ability to, to, uh, 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 to persuade the adjudicator in a uh, oral hearing of, of their case, I don't. I, um, I, I think that in, in we're going to, we're, we're going to see some struggles in, in the course in the course of the next year to two years about what gets heard orally, uh, what gets heard in person, what gets heard over Zoom, and what gets heard in writing. And I, uh, I, I think that I, uh, many organizations, I'm, I'm, uh, uh, my involvement right now is with the Advocate Society, and I know the Advocate Society is working on it, and other organizations are working on it, are working on uh, uh, positions with respect to uh, what what should happen on a go forward basis, but we're, that's going to be a struggle. That's going to be a struggle for advocates over the course of the next year to two years. It, uh, um, I, I think we all agree, uh, and when I say we all, I'm including the courts, judges, the government. We all agree on on the obvious ones. We all enjoy that 9:30 commercial court appointments are are now over Zoom. We all the other case conferences that the things where you would take an hour to get to court in order to argue a, or to present on a five minute consent motion, uh, I only to have an hour and a half getting back so that it's three hours for something that's five minutes and it's it is it still to me feels remarkable to be able to sit in my office and actually deal with that in, in five minutes instead of uh, in two and a half hours. Um, we all agree on those. I, I think we even all agree um, uh, on, on things like uh, pretrials um, uh, or other types of case conferences uh, or on simple motions. I, I think we all, but, but there, uh, uh, there are many others where uh, where I think it, it landing on on uh, uh, landing in a place where we ought to land um, in terms of uh, what uh, what has to be in person, what can be over Zoom, um, uh, what can be in writing, uh, where uh, do do oral submissions fall into things. I, I, I think we're, we're, we're going to be struggling with that for a little bit of time to come. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I just want to uh, change gears for a short while here uh, and uh, return to your career path. So I know you're from Ottawa and after your undergraduate education, you were accepted into the uh, LLB program at the University of Toronto, correct? Yes. Right. So you came to Toronto then in early 90s for law school and uh, you, were, you never really lived in Toronto before, correct? That's right. Okay. So I also came to Toronto years ago uh, as an outsider, and I'm curious to compare our notes. So what was it like for you to come to Toronto to go to school in 1992? 
when I came to Toronto, I certainly had no intention of staying. I, um, my intention was to go back to Ottawa and, uh, and practice law in Ottawa. Um, I, I did not, I did not intend to stay. Uh, but then, you know, as they say, life happens. I, um, I, I liked Toronto. I, the longer I've, I've, I've lived here, the, the, the more I like it. Um, my only complaint about Toronto is, uh, is that it takes so long to get out of it. It, uh, and the longer exactly. I've lived here, the longer it takes to get out of it. It, uh, um, but it's a great city. And I guess the single biggest reason that I stayed in Toronto is because I fell in love with a Torontonian who's a true blue Torontonian and she could not imagine living anywhere else on the planet. You found a local. <laughs> <laughs> it's the key of uh, getting accepted somewhere. <laughs> I, I'm, I know that as an immigrant. So you um, stayed in Toronto, you articled, uh, did you article at Teplitsky Carlson? No, I articled at a large firm. I articled mm. at a large firm, and uh, I, and a, certainly a large firm was was uh, not for me. So I wanted to go to a litigation boutique firm, and I landed at Tepsky Coulson. Oh wow! And then you um, did you found did you co-found your law firm, your current law firm? No, I. Uh, at Teplitsky Coulson, I worked for Bob Coulson and for Colin Stevenson. And uh, Colin, when Colin decided to start his own firm, he, uh, I went with him. He asked me to go with him and I went with him. And so the firm was originally uh, Stevenson's and eventually became Stevenson, Welton, McDonald and Swan. Um, uh, but then uh, McDonald and Swan uh, uh, broke off and we became Stevenson Welton. I see. So you, uh, so Colin brought you over. Yeah. And uh, you, but you eventually became the managing partner. I did. I, uh, I became, I became a partner after, uh, uh, not sure what, after four or five years. And, uh, um, and after about another five years, uh, Colin said to me, why don't, why don't you take over management? It, uh, uh, Colin was not then and is not now terribly interested in management. Um, so it, 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 it fairly quickly fell onto my shoulders. I uh, am a sole practitioner, so I have my own law practice. Uh, I'm, I'm really curious, and again, I want to compare notes. <laughs> what is it like to be a managing partner at a firm of several lawyers. How many lawyers, by the way, do we have at your firm right now? We have 11. 11 lawyers what? and law students. Right. So what is it like? What, is, what are the responsibilities of the managing partner? How is the managing partner different from other partners? Um, well, that's an interesting question. I, I, what I'm, it, the, the, I mean, the easiest way of describing it is that I'm responsible for the, the management of the firm. Um, I, I, what that means on a day-to-day -day basis, I would imagine is different firm to firm, but fairly early on when, uh, when I started managing the firm, um, I, had uh, drinks with Linda Rothstein, who at the time was managing Pallier Roland. And Linda Rothstein said to me, the, the best advice I can give you is, uh, is overpay for a very good office manager. And the advice uh, I think is excellent advice. It, um, uh, so, I, I, what I am largely responsible for 
is overseeing the operations as opposed to engaging in each of the operations. Um, I, but I, I oversee the financial operations, the, the, the day to day of the law firm. Um, and of course, I, and I'm sure this is absolutely no different for you, that the, the larger uh, strategic decisions. It, um, I, where, what type of firm do you want to be? What type of firm do you want to become? Um, how, how, where do you want to be in five years time? Where do you want to be in 10 years time? And uh, what are, the, what are the, the, the steps that you have to take to get there? And I assume that you're also uh, responsible or that you oversee hiring decisions, right? Yes, which is a big, which falls within the where do you want to be? Uh, but yes, it um, I oversee uh, hiring um, uh, of staff, and uh, I, and then of course there's there's the uh, 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 articling program um, and uh, any other hiring decisions that have to be made. What do you look for in lawyer candidates, um, whether junior or article stu articling students or more senior? So, uh, for example, I know that you have great lawyers. I know that you hire great lawyers. Uh, my friend Neil uh, works with you, and I know he's a fantastic lawyer. Uh, so you must have a secret uh, of finding talent. And uh, I'm also interested, like I said, for the benefit of our uh, law students who watch and listen to this or junior lawyers, what kind of profile are you looking for when you're hiring a lawyer? So there, there's no, there's no cutter profile of, of a good litigator. It, uh, uh, as we've just talked about, good, good litigators are, uh, it, it will be a variety of, of personality types um, uh, and, and of, of uh, a variety of characteristics. Um, the first thing that I personally really look for is, do you want to litigate? It is, is this, it, 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 litigation is hard. It, litigation is, is hard. It's, it's stressful and, and every single piece of it is hard and becoming good at it is very hard. It takes an awful lot of time and an awful lot of effort, and uh, and you know it's not American television. You 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 don't land in a courtroom and uh, uh, and suddenly you're able to make these commands. It, it, it's hard. It's hard work and it's stressful. And um, I and so it in my view from from what I've seen, uh, I think that that. Uh, uh, wanting to litigate is is key, and and being wanting it badly enough uh, uh, that that you're prepared to commit to to the work that's involved at mastering it is uh, is key. Now, I will say that I do think people can want to be a litigator and change their minds after a couple of years. And that's, that, is, that is fair enough. I, I completely get that. But when I'm hiring, um, I'm looking for someone who, uh, I, that this is what they want to do. And uh, my firm is committed um, to giving its uh, junior lawyers um, genuine opportunities to become good at this. Because of course, you don't become good at this without doing it. You can't learn to cross-examine by, by uh, watching tapes of cross-examinations. You can, you can learn something about it, but you're not going to become good at it. You're not going to personally master it unless you do it. And so we're, we're committed to, to giving our junior lawyers the opportunities um, to become good at this craft. 
and uh, uh, and I I I want to hear from people. Um, this is what I want to do, and and I uh, uh, and I want the opportunities to uh, to 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 develop this expertise. It uh, so that's the first thing I look for, and I know that was a long answer, and I apologize. I um, I the second I, I love long answer. I love long answers. You the, know, it's like in discoveries. You you want the witness to go on and on and on. <laughs> That's true. I'm doing exactly what you do want the witness to do in discoveries. The uh, the second thing I look for is um, uh, is that I, uh, I I I hope uh, that our firm um, I, I is is a a uh, a, a pleasant place to work. I, uh, I, I have said uh, at various firm meetings, it is important to me um, that people uh, want to come to work here, that, uh, that, it, that, that, uh, uh, that it's, it's not a question as they're walking in the front door of dreading the day, that, that as they're walking in the front door that they're going somewhere that they want to be. It, uh, um, I, uh, and so I'm, I'm, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm looking, uh, for people who, who it, it enjoy law and, uh, and enjoy, enjoy what it is that, that, that we do. And, uh, I, and then of course, and then of course I'm looking for everything that you'd You'd expect that I would be looking for. Um, I, I'm, 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 I'm uh, uh, looking for 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 people who were involved and engaged in law school, and uh, I, I, and and I, I it it uh, are involved in uh, their communities. Uh, whoever those communities may be, and and uh, uh, everything that um, that you would expect. Maureen, I really appreciate this uh, chance to speak with you. Uh, like I said earlier, not everyone gets to hear from senior members of the bar. Most of us here in Ontario are really sole and uh, very small firm practitioners. And when I was starting out, uh, there was no interview show where I could go and without paying for CPD credits, uh, uh, could hear a senior lawyer's experience. So I really appreciate that you shared your experience with our viewers and listeners today. I uh, learned something today. I hope uh, our viewers and listeners learned something too. Thank you so much. And uh, I wish you all the best in your practice. Thank you. What's that? No, thank you for the opportunity. Thank you for the opportunity. And uh, and it's good to hear from senior members of, of, of the bar. I I, uh, I agree with that. But I have to say, I um I I've had opportunities to to uh, I hear from more junior members of the bar, and that's also important, and it's also exciting. There's a lot, the, the changes that are happening in the legal profession are good and are important and, um, uh, and are overdue. And, and it, uh, it's exciting to see it. It's exciting, I'll be, it's exciting to see where we'll be in five years time and in 10 years time on the big issues of diversity and inclusion and access to justice. And as I said, technology, uh, which I think greatly impacts access to justice, and it's an exciting time. And and it, it it more senior members of the bar have a lot to say, but I think junior members of the bar uh, have have also have a lot to say, and it's and it's important and it's good. So thank you for this. Absolutely, absolutely. I'm with you 100. Thank you so much, Maureen. Thank you.